Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I'm here to help you finish your Christmas shopping list and let everyone else over there stiff arm their competition while trying to fight off that trip to fan on Turkey Night. Now, what we did was we partnered with Rochester Sports Autographs, the largest JSA authenticated autograph distributor in the United States, where you can get up to 75% off over 30,000 autographed sports collectibles during this holiday season. They have something for everyone. But how is RSA able to offer such great deals on JSA authentication, you ask? Well, they do this by making deals directly with athletes so there are no extra markups, and they choose to then pass that savings on to you, the customer. Now, all orders from Rochester Sports Autographs are top quality and shipped to your door with top authentication and a money-back guarantee. But hurry up because customers are so stark raving mad for RSA that memorabilia sells out daily. All you have to do is head over to shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. Again, that's shoprsa.com forward slash SHN. So don't wait to bring home your favorites and own a piece of sports history for you and the loved ones on your shopping list this holiday season. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. The Rose Bowl. The game that inspired the college football bowl season has a long and storied history. The stadium itself is 100 years old, and in celebration of it, Pigskin Dispatch is assembling some of the top historians and authors to share the memories, people, and events that make the granddaddy of them all the special game that it is. Enjoy this Rose Bowl memory from pigskindispatch.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And we are still in December, and it is Rose Bowl Celebration Month at 100 years of the Rose Bowl Stadium. And we are spending the entire month of December on Pigskin Dispatch just celebrating the great game, the people, the places, everything connected with the Rose Bowl. And uh, really hope you are enjoying this uh, great journey that we're going through. And tonight is no exception. It's more Rose Bowl. And we have another historian, author, who has some great information, uh, has uh, some books uh, on subject matter he's going to be talking about. And that's Joe Ziemba of the uh, When Football Was Football podcast. And of course, his multiple books on football history. Joe Ziemba, welcome back to the Pig Pen. Hey, thank you, Darren. As I mentioned before, it's always a pleasure to talk football with you. And last time I was in the Pig Pen, I had to sit on a bale of hay and I've noticed you're remodeling. I've got a folding chair. It only has three legs, but I've got great balance for my age. So I'll do my best, Darren. Thanks well, that, for having me. Well, the chairs for me, Joe, the, the, we, we upgraded your bale of hay to a bale of straw. It's over there to the left. Oh, I like it. Oh, all right. <laughs> don't don't uh, complain if you're a little itchy. So, <laughs> well, hey, we are glad to have you back here. We always appreciate uh, your gridiron knowledge and uh, things that you share with us because it really we take some nuggets home and I know the listeners do. I hear a lot of great comments from them every time you're on. So we're really uh, enjoying this uh, whole Rose Bowl celebration and can't wait to get uh, your input on this great history of the game you're going to talk about tonight and uh, some of the great people that played in the game. And uh, I'll I'll let you take it from there. Oh, sure. Well, Well, the reason I have such an interest in the Rose Bowl game of 1919 was that a Chicago team was involved. And as you've heard in the previous episodes, The Rose Bowl back then was called the Tournament East-West Football Game, and basically it was supposed to get some college teams together. But because of the war going on in 1917 and 1918, the uh, tournament organizers invited military service-based teams to play, and that's what happened again after the 1918 season when Mare Island of California, who made an appearance the previous year, was invited back to play the Great Lakes uh, Naval Training Center from Glenview, Illinois. And Great Lakes is really an amazing team. 
uh, the players were really actively recruited. They, they had a choice back then. They could get drafted into the service and end up in France or something, which those guys at that time, and I always admired them for this, they were willing to do. But with Great Lakes, they had an opportunity to play sports. Great Lakes uh, offered basketball, baseball, football teams, other all sorts of sports for the service guys to be involved with. And this was due to a guy named Captain William Moffat who was the commandant of the base. And as I mentioned, he actively recruited some of the uh, folks to play there. In fact, there's an article in a newspaper called the Collier's eye that talked about this. And he was talking more about baseball players, but the same was true for football. Uh, The paper said any major league player anxious to join the United States Navy will have no trouble in this direction. If he will address captain William a Moffat commandant at this point, He says he wants the best money he can get, and he will sign up every healthy professional player who cares to come here. So that was kind of an open door for a lot of the athletes. There was no pro football at the time uh, in in terms of a specific league, but there was professional baseball. And Great Lakes was able to attract quite a few good players. And this resulted in in a wonderful football team that went undefeated in 1918 with a 7-0-2 mark but they played a lot of the major colleges and you may ask, why were they playing major colleges? We had, because we had two things going on in 1918. One was the war world war one. And we also had a uh, epidemic of the Spanish flu. And so large crowds were not permitted. Um, a lot of times they colleges just decided they were going to throw in the towel and not even have a team. But we had others that just played a few games throughout the season from Indiana to Baylor that, maybe played four or five games or none at all. So that left an open spot for these service teams to to jump in and schedule a major college schedule that fall of 1918. Wow. Now, Joe, I just got a couple of questions and I I probably I'm going to show my naiveness of this. Now I've been to Chicago multiple times, but Great Lakes was in in the city of Chicago. Was that what Navy Pier is, is all about? Yeah, Navy Pier did a lot of training, especially during World War II, but Great Lakes was north of the city in a suburb, but right on Lake Michigan as well. So they could uh, do some training there as well. Ah, okay. Very good. Thank you. Now, uh, so so Great Lakes, uh, what, what kind of the big colleges did they play, Joe? Did they play like the, the Notre Dames and uh, Northwesterns in that, that area, or did they travel around the country a bit? They did a little bit of both. The The biggest, biggest threat to them was the U.S. Naval Academy. But before they got to that place, and I should mention that the roster for this team was phenomenal. It was so good that Pro Football Hall of Famer Jimmy Councilman was not a starter on the Great Leagues team. But wow. we did have George Hallis, who was the founder of the Chicago Bears, as we know. Patty Driscoll, the star of the Chicago Cardinals. Did I say Chicago Cardinals for Hallis? It was Chicago yeah. Bears. And Patty Driscoll of the Chicago Cardinals. A lot of other well-known players in college at the time. Since we know that colleges back then were much more well-known for football than anyone that was playing post-collegiate before the NFL started. So the team started out um, with these this great, great roster. In fact, 17 of them eventually played in the NFL when it got started. But they opened up on September 28th, defeating Iowa 10 to nothing. And Iowa had future Hall of Famer Duke Slater in the lineup. And that opened some eyes up because this was really the start of something new and big. And people didn't know how to react to the service team. And they followed that up with a 27-0 romp over Purdue. Uh, So they had some really, really good games against big teams. Uh, They defeated Illinois 7-0 where Hellas got some compliments uh, in one of the papers that said, George Hellas, former all round athlete of the university of Illinois was one of the stars in open field playing for the visitors. They had a couple of ties with Northwestern, uh, which was a zero zero tie. And then they tied Notre Dame seven to seven. This is a game, which is really a lot of fun to look at. If, if we know then, knew then what we know now, the individuals playing in that game, we had on the Irish side, uh, George Gipp, uh, Curly Lambeau. Uh, we had Patty Driscoll in the lineup, uh, George Hallis, of course. So we had some really, really big names. It was an exhibition game, of course, but it ended up in a 7-7 tie. And Newt Rockney said afterwards that he was satisfied with the game. 
We went into the game as the underdogs and gave them a good fight. The game shows we have as a good a team as anyone in the West. So Notre Dame was still playing, uh, obviously, with some of the other schools. But as the team went on, it was Patty Driscoll, the five foot eight quarterback who really got known around the world, the football world. Uh, when the team beat Rutgers 54 to 14, uh, Driscoll scored six touchdowns and added five extra points. And so it was, it was quite amazing, the uh, incredible ability of Patty Driscoll. And uh, so it was the type of teams, they, they didn't shy away from anyone. Uh, they had that big game, as I mentioned, with Navy, which they won seven to six. And there was a wonderful incident in that game, which we can laugh at now. Kind of reminds me of the Three Stooges shorts that we used to always see, but someone on the Great Lakes broke away and someone popped off the bench for Navy and tackled the guy. So uh, they awarded him a touchdown. It was the only touchdown of the game. <laughs> so it was about this time that uh, word was getting out that Great Lakes might be considered for the Rose Bowl. And there were several teams on the West Coast that were already being looked at as well. Uh, I saw a great quote from a guy named Herman Spitzel. He was the uh, coach of Mather Field in California, and he thought his team should, team should have been considered. In fact, he said, really, we're feared in the Northern California area as much as the influenza. We have the best team on the coast. It is a veritable cyclone win in action. We're after that New Year's Day game with Great Lakes. So that kind of started the buildup, Darren. We now had Great Lakes that was going to be invited, but who was going to be the other opponent? Hmm. Okay. Now that that's uh. So the Great Lakes was decided long before uh, any of the other ones, and I assume they wanted to have a West Coast team as their opponent. Yeah, the idea was to get an East Coast uh, military team. <laughs> Chicago is not on the East Coast. It's not even on the North Coast of Pennsylvania, where I believe you're familiar with. But they were looking for a West Coast team. And so there was two or three that might have been considered. Rockwell Field, Mather Field, and, of course, uh, Mayor uh, were the three that were in consideration. But first, Great Lakes had a couple more games in the month of December. They defeated Purdue on December 1st, 27 to zip. And then they had a home game where they played the seventh regiment of the Great Lakes Regional Championships, uh, which they beat 26 to zero. And it was almost as the Great Lakes team was playing the intramural champions from the base. And that's been kind of a lost game. I'm including it in their final record of seven, zero and two, but eh, a lot of historians say the Great Lakes only had six wins, but it was supposed to be a, a pretty rugged game at the time. In fact, there's a publication called the Great Lakes Bulletin, which described the game, which was played in a horrendous rainstorm. And it said rolling, sliding, gliding, and almost as swimming. It was more for the mud championship than anything else. It was hard for the players involved to determine which man was of his own machine or team, uh, the field being quite sloppy. And it was shortly after this time that it was finally announced. The news came forward that Great Lakes would play Mare Island in the Rose Bowl on January 1st, 1919. Okay. Now, Joe, Joe you mentioned uh, going, staying in the regular season games, that th their game with Notre Dame was an exhibition. Were the games with the other uh, universities, were those exhibitions as well? Yeah, I probably uh, gave a misconception there. They were all considered regular season games. Uh, a lot of people might consider them as exhibitions because they weren't really between colleges versus colleges. But I, I think in terms of Great Lakes, they counted that as a regular season victory. Notre Dame, I'm not sure. I probably should have checked that. Uh, okay. Probably might have considered it an exhibition because they weren't playing other college teams. But and, Thinking of the time and place with the flu going on and very few collegiate teams having having clubs at that time, uh, I have to check and see if it actually really went down as a uh, tie in Notre Dame's all time records. Okay, well that would that would make sense because I'm sure probably I know some of the eligibility rules were, were thrown out the window during wartime, but you had I, Hallis had to probably have a lot of years uh, under collegiately, you know, being at Illinois and then playing on these Great Lakes teams. Uh, and probably some of the other gentlemen as well. So maybe that's how they skirted around it. Yeah, they probably did. Hallis actually skipped a year before between high school and college. So yeah, he had some age in him compared to some of the Notre Dame or Northwestern players he went up against. <laughs> okay. All right. So this, I, I guess that takes us down. We have our matchup down to Mare Island. We have Great Lakes. And uh, what happened at the Rose Bowl? 
Well, the Great Lakes had to get on that train for a four-day trip, three or four-day trip out to California. And they brought along their own referee, Walter Eckersall, the great from University of Chicago, who also moonlighted, or vice versa, as a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And during every stop that the train with Great Lakes was on, every stop they made, Eckersall would file a story. Uh, when they were in Kansas City after the first night, I believe, he wrote, last night at Kansas City, hundreds of soldiers who had been discharged from Camp Funston boarded the train. With so many servicemen aboard, the train resembled a wartime special. And, and really, the Great Lakes guys were on the war path. They, they were anxious to get to California to play Mare Island. And Mare Island was 10 and 0 versus the 7 0 and 2 team from Great Lakes. And a lot of the Los Angeles papers provided really extensive coverage of, uh, of Great Lakes and the team members. They were, in particular, very anxious to watch Patty Driscoll. Uh, a great, a great uh, little quote from the Los Angeles uh, Times was, from the moment the Great Lakes team lumbered onto the turf, the tall, youthfully big youngsters were favorites. Their manifest health and condition made their size as well as the easy grace with which they handled the ball Instantly popular with the crowd, but everybody wanted to see Paddy Driscoll and could easily distinguish the little knock-kneed Irishman by his diminutive size. But <laughs> once Paddy got out in the field before 26,000 spectators, he uh, really dominated the game, both with his running, his passing, his returns, his defense. And his kicking, he was one of the old-time dropkick uh, experts. And so one of the uh, uh, things that I saw about that was one of his kick returns, which, again, the Los Angeles Times said, the ball scarcely seemed to be in his hands when the little Irishman was off swerving to the right and to the left like a swallow flying low in the morning. Isn't that poetic, Darren, oh, for a football yeah. game? <laughs> I, I've got the, the essence of gracefulness uh, out of that quote, so... <laughs> So uh, Driscoll a kicked a uh, first quarter uh, field goal, gave Great Lakes a three zip lead, was good from 30 yards. Then the team scored again, a touchdown by Andrew Reeves in the second quarter, and that gave him a 10 to nothing lead. And then in the uh, second half, George Ellis caught a pass from Driscoll, and it was a 32 yard touchdown for the final score of 17 0. But Hallis is still known because he intercepted a pass and returned it about 80 yards, but he didn't score. And apparently this is still a Rose Bowl record of the longest interception return without being a touchdown. But uh, when they were talking about who was the MVP, George Hallis actually won the MVP. And, and that's also interesting about Hallis. He only played really one year in college at Illinois. His sophomore season, he, I think he broke his uh, – what would he do? He broke something. Uh, he broke his leg. And next year he broke his jaw or vice versa. So only played his senior year. And Great Lakes really uh, gave him an opportunity to play against some good players. And uh, he was named MVP. But uh, and Walter Eckersall wrote in his summary, he said, Patty Driscoll put on his usual stellar game. He made the first score by sending a field goal from the 35-yard line in the first period, while his great returns of punts and open field runs electrified the spectators. He handled punts cleanly and caught them in his usual sure manner. But George Hallis was not far behind. The former line I was everywhere at the right time. One of his great feats was an 80-yard run after he had intercepted a forward pass on his own 10-yard line. And so Hallis was the MVP. Great Lakes won 17 0 to protect their undefeated season. And when Hallis got home, he told his mother he was done with football. He was going to become a Major League Baseball player at the New York Yankees that spring. <laughs> okay. And so I guess uh, his uh, prediction was a little off on, on that. I mean, he did yeah. play some, some baseball, but uh, I think he's better known for football than his baseball. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As George admitted in his autobiography, he hit uh, 091 in 11 games and admitted he could not hit the curveball and spent the rest of the year at the St. Paul minor league team for the New York Yankees. Huh, okay. <laughs> wow. So that's some great history. I mean, and Konzelman rode the pine. He, he wasn't, uh, then get in that lineup of that, that great lake. Yeah. Team. He came in and, and as a substitute. Wow, that's a pretty good substitute to have come off the bench, yeah. that's for sure. 
Wow, Joe, great, great history there. That's uh, you know, excellent uh, take on that. And I, I love all the quotes and uh, you know the Eckersaw quotes and the LA Times quotes. Uh, just brings a lot of uh, colorfulness to this game and and what's going on at the time, and really preserves the football history. So thank you so much for that. You know, thank you. And it was the last time military schools played in the Rose Bowl, and I guess I'm grateful for that too. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, that that's surprising that. Um, well, I, I guess eventually they got into the, the Big Ten versus the the Pacific Coast uh, teams, but uh, you know I'm surprised like you know the armies or and Navy n- none of them ever got into those in mm-hmm. between there before they really got established into that. That's kind of kind of odd to me because uh, those yeah. are some good programs. So, hmm. Well, Joe, I, I thank you very much for for helping us celebrate this uh, Rose Bowl history. And I know we've got you signed up a little bit later here this month to, to talk about another great Rose Bowl moment and game. And uh, we'll be excited to hear about you when you talk about that one as well. Oh, that'll be a lot of fun. It'll be a Rose Bowl game not played in Southern California, which is pretty unique in itself. So I'm looking forward to that as well, Darren. Thank you. All right, Joe. Well, hey, uh, take care. Uh, we'll keep on listening to when football is football. and. Uh, uh, we thank you so much for helping us celebrate this uh, Rose Bowl month. Always a, always a pleasure. Thank you, Darren. Take care until next time. Thanks a lot. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. A special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and we're able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds, as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.